everybody, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Cannabis Science Technology for a Better Quality of Life, presented by <coughs> Russell Sosmo, founder of the Medical Cannabis Society. My name is Patrick Nightingale, and I'm the Executive Director of the Medical Cannabis Society, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you're having trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having problems. Now, please join me in welcoming Mr. Sosasmo. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you, Patrick. Certainly. Cannabis sativa, a truly versatile plant, helps with a lot of things. It's one of the fastest growing plants that Mother Nature has to offer. And we have record of it being one of the first plants to be spun into usable fiber some 10,000 years ago. The beauty of hemp is that it requires no pesticides or chemicals to grow. And the growing nature of the plant <clears throat> has the roots uh, somewhat choking out other weeds, uh, making it flourish. and overpowers the ability for other weeds and plants to sustain themselves. It allows the hemp plant to grow freely. Uh, that's much of the reason that it's named weed. Hemp itself can be refined into many things uh, to cover a variety of commercial uses such as clothing, biodegradable plastic, and paper which will ultimately be part of its demise in years in the future. It can also be used for building. So for example, you could walk into a hemp house where the frame was constructed of hemp molding, the insulation of hemp fiber, the paint on the walls derived from hemp itself, even down to the canvas paintings on the wall which Ironically, cannabis uh, was named after the word cannabis. So, hemp's one of the most strongest and most durable of all textile fibers. It works great for clothing. In regards to cotton, it requires half the amount of water that you would need to produce a field of cotton. It grows very quickly, and it produces about 250% uh, more fiber than the same amount of cotton in the same uh, type of field. So, hemp can be made into fuel in addition to that. Uh, not just fuel for machinery and biofuel, but human fuel and animal fuel. In fact, uh, in its raw form, hemp is one of the most nutritionally um, complete foods really on the planet. It has a perfect balance of omega-3s and omega-6s, as well as all the amino acids. Some 2,700 years ago, in 2,700 BC, uh, we had word of cannabis showing up as a medicine for the first time. At the time, China was infusing it into teas for maladies such as malaria, constipation, and memory loss, or early Alzheimer's. Just to give you a frame of reference, in 6500 BC, we started rice cultivation in China. Around 5200 BC, we started to see the domestication of chickens, and then 3600 BC was the first appearance of silk in China. So at 2700 BC, we started to see cannabis for medical purposes. About 1,300 years later, in Egypt, we started to see Egyptians using this for things such as glaucoma, and much like the Egyptian culture at the time, they were putting everything into enemas and administering it that way. Meanwhile, over in Italy, uh, I'm sorry, in India, uh, they were using it for leprosy and mixing it with milk to use as an anesthetic. Fast forward to 100 BC, and they finally have on record is starting to identify some of the psychoactive properties of marijuana in China. Moving forward to about 1200 AD, we have reports of Marco Polo reporting back to Europe about cannabis use in the, all over the world. By the 1600s, cannabis made its way to Europe. And we have record of William Shakespeare going on record saying that he was using this as a stimulant to produce um, his plays and, and, and writings. Others in England were using this as melancholy or for melancholy or as we like to call it today, depression. And in fact, the tea itself was given to the Queen of England to use for menstrual cramps. In the 1600s, people started to make their way over to the Americas, uh, where Jamestown in 1607 was the first permanent English settlement uh, 
that was founded by King James. They made it colony law in 1619 that all residents were required to grow Indian hemp and send it back to England to support uh, England and their cause. So we make it in the 1700s, and America's starting to make their way. George Washington was growing hemp as one of his three main crops at Mount Vernon. In Virginia, you could actually be jailed for refusing to grow hemp in the late 16, I'm sorry, late 1700s. Uh, cannabis was actually used to pay taxes, and back then you could use it to barter. Fast forward to 1776, July 4th in Philadelphia, our nation's founding fathers signed a document that announced that 13 colonies were going to go ahead and separate themselves from the British Empire. They were going to regard, regard themselves as 13 independent sovereign states. That document was a declaration of independence, and that was created out of hemp. Our founding fathers grew it, and in fact, Thomas Jefferson stated that hemp would be the cash crop that our country would be built on. Going into the 1800s, as far as medicine goes, the United States was a very do-it-yourself type of culture. You would go down to your local apothecary and you would have them whip up something, uh, whether it was an oil, tincture, a cream, some sort of ointment, lozenges, candies, you name it. They put it together and, and it would help uh, remedy your particular ailment. There was a man by the name of Sir William O'Shaughnessy. He introduced therapeutic use of cannabis in Western medicine and was able to validate some of the folk uses that we had seen in India. He was able to discover some of the new applications and ultimately recommended cannabis for a great variety of things. And I think he, he established his reputation by successfully relieving the pain of rheumatism and uh, being able to stop the convulsions of children, so early age epilepsy. In 1950, up until the mid-1930s, cannabis was officially listed in the United States Pharmacopeia as working for things like gout, tonsillitis, insanity, alcoholism, um, but probably about 100 different uses it was the prime medicine for within this pharmacopoeia. And what I want to mention here is you look at the slide that we have, uh, that's a, a picture of the Pittsburgh Commercial Gazette from the late 1800s. And if you look here, it's, there's an ad that's, that's identified that shows that uh, hashish candy from Philadelphia. If you go to the next slide here, if you uh, zoom in, it says, For returned soldiers whose constitutions have become shattered by the hardships of the camp, they may find relief in its use when all other remedies fail. For nervousness, headache, low spirits, cough, neuralgia, loss of appetite, chronic diarrhea, asthma, and dysentery. It stands unrivaled. And I think it's interesting because back then they didn't have post-traumatic stress disorder as we would call it today, but obviously these are the same symptoms. And they are explaining here that cannabis obviously was unrivaled at the time as far as a remedy goes. So as early as 1853, we started to see recreational cannabis uh, become available. Uh, every major city on the East Coast started to see these cannabis dens pop up. Uh, you saw a lot of the opium dens at that time. In New York, there was probably about 500 of these cannabis dens that were right next to the opium dens. So they went hand in hand, about 500 um, about that time. In an effort to kind of regulate where all this was going, the United States stepped up and introduced the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. And it basically made it so that anything that wasn't a, a standardized medicine was considered a poison, and it basically prohibited the sale outside of uh, pharmacies or apothecaries. It wasn't really a problem for pharma, and they jumped in and from roughly the 1900s to the 1930s, started selling cannabis extracts over the counter for about 100 different things. If you look at this slide here, we have uh, an example of what the early days looked like. Uh, there's a, um, a label from Eli Lilly from 1913, from a cannabis indica extract. In 1930, we had a gentleman by the name of Henry Anslinger, who became the founding commissioner of the Treasury's Federal Bureau of Narcotics. He was appointed by his uncle, Andrew Mellon, who at the time was the richest man in the world, and he was put in place to crack down on prohibition. He was given a budget of $100,000 and sent free. 
Unfortunately for Anslinger, prohibition ended in 1933. And at that time, alcohol was then legal. And Anslinger, as the guy that was put in place to crack down on prohibition, didn't have much to do. He then decided to start demonizing cannabis, tying it to immigrants that were coming up from Mexico, and he called it marijuana. He claimed that it caused people to commit violent crimes and act irrationally and overly sexual. He then started producing propaganda films to promote this, and eventually the rest of the country took on. At the time, the federal government didn't have any authority over the states because they had implemented the Tenth Amendment to regulate medicines. Uh, that power was only reserved, I'm sorry, I'll just take that back. The federal government had no authority under the 10th Amendment to regulate medicines. That power was reserved by in individual states in 1937. The only way to do this was impose a federal tax so they could legislate it. So the decision of the con uh, Congress in 1937 was to pass the Marijuana Tax Act. And it was based on poorly attended hearings and reports on questionable studies, all generated by Henry Anslinger himself. Harry. Henry. Harry. 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 Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, basically, this made marijuana illegal for anything outside of medical and industrial uses, and you needed to have uh, this tax to make it happen. The American Medical Association opposed the act. Um, they were claiming that cannabis was working and there was no evidence of this being harmful. And in fact, Dr. William Woodford, which was a doctor, a, a lawyer of the time, uh, was legislative counsel for the American Medical Association. And he testified before Congress in 1937, uh, stating that um, prohibition loses the sight of the fact that future investigation may show that there are substantial medical benefits and uses for cannabis. Unfortunately, he went unheard. Anslinger got to keep his job. And uh, he cracked down on marijuana across the United States. Now, looking back at hemp, um, this is the late 1930s, they had just invented the decorticator, which was a, a farm machine that basically gave farmers the ability to pull the, the um, fibers out of hemp for the first time on a small scale. So they were able to put this on these small farms. It saved massive amounts of labor and uh, made hemp production practical on a small scale. So hemp itself could be used for about 5,000 purposes and can get three harvests out of a single year. In February of 1938, Popular Mechanics reported that hemp was the new billion dollar crop. And it was due to, it was entirely due to the fact that we had this ability to mass produce this through the decorticator. In 1942, we have a video here, you see the slide. <clears throat> this is uh, Hemp for Victory. And the film itself was made to encourage farmers to grow hemp for the war effort because we were obviously short on it, and uh, the industrial fibers were, were wonderful for war. Before 1989, it was, it was unknown that this film was, was put out there. Um, in fact, the United States government, um, no, you're good. The United States government um, wanted to let our civilians and citizens know how to grow hemp, how it's processed, how it's used for rope, cloth, cordage, and things of that nature that could be used for war. Um, including fire hoses, parachute webbing, canvas, tow lines, you name it. Um, the United States Department of Agriculture and the Library of Congress told all interested parties that this movie was never even made and it wasn't available. Luckily, two VHS copies were recovered and donated to uh, the Library of Con Congress in 1989 by Mia Farrow, Carl Packard, and the marijuana advocate and well-known Jack Herrera. Now, back in, the, in 1939, 1935, per se, uh, when there was a shortage of hemp, DuPont started working on nylon, which was a synthetic competitor. It was made out of rayon. Andrew Mellon, who we spoke about earlier, and the uncle to Anslinger, was the secre Secretary of Treasury at the time and also the wealthiest man in America. He invested heavily into DuPont and uh, really counted on its success, of course, depending on whether hemp was going to be short or not. See, uh, things seemed headed that way until 1945, the war ended abruptly, and we then had a surplus of hemp. It was bad news for Mr. Mellon and the DuPont family. Um, Mellon and Lameau DuPont had major financial interest in this to promote their own products. Really, all chemical companies 
uh, had a problem with hemp because you could grow it yourself. Additionally, the surplus of hemp could crush a guy like William Randolph Hearst, who owned all the media outlets and all the newspapers in the United States. Uh, it was at the point that he started to work on um, yellow journalism to start to demonize the cannabis plant. And if you look at why, he was really one of the first major special interests outside of DuPont and uh, the synthetic fabric industry. And the fact that he owned the media outlets, he owned the lumber mills to support the media outlets, and he also owned the lumber fields to support the lumber mills and the paper production. The promise of hemp-based products was so great that they threatened to really replace all the petroleum-based products and petrochemicals, um, including synthetic fibers and gasoline. When you look at hemp uh, in, in compared to lumber, one acre of hemp can produce the same amount of uh, plant fiber that you would get out of four acres of trees, not to mention it takes 90 days to renew plant uh, hemp, and obviously we know trees take years. If you think this was intimidating to those guys, Mellon, DuPont, and Hearst, you're right. And there was billions of dollars at risk um, to their old school cronies and financial backers because of hemp and its new surplus. At the time, when you look at Popular Mechanics magazine, uh, they boasted that Henry Ford's first Model T was built out of hemp. The doors themselves were made out of plastic. The, 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 the uh, rest of the car was made out of hemp products as well. Um, they were able to take a sledgehammer and literally smack the side of this thing without any dent to the hemp plastic. And it was 10 times lighter than steel to boot. Ford envisioned this car running on hemp uh, products as well. The fact is that stuff threatened DuPont and it threatened Hearst and his timber mill and media empire. If you look at the slide here, we have Henry Ford quoted as saying, why use up the forests, which are centuries in the making, and the mines which required ages to lay down if we can get the equivalent of forest and mineral products in the annual growth of hemp fields. To think that Henry Ford was trying to give the world a vehicle that was safe, strong, and clean, didn't hurt the environment, and yet that invention was completely suppressed by special interest. When you look at how it, compi it, it complies with every single eco standard that we have today. In fact, it blows them all out of the water. The suppression of this technology was largely due to the fact that hemp was outlawed in 1937 due to the potential damaging effect that it would have on many powerful industries at the time. Cannabis ended up being rebranded, tied to marijuana and tied to immigrants. And Anslinger Hearst, DuPont and Mellon crafted a highly inflammatory anti-marijuana public relations campaign with the goal of really making the euphoric herb illegal and effectively eliminating it as a competitor to hemp and all the petrochemical products and timber for Hearst. The cultivation of, can of cannabis and hemp ended up becoming legal, illegal in the United States in 1937. It's been illegal ever since. Fast forward to 1970. There's a man by the name of Richard Nixon who grew up watching the Reefer Madness campaigns on TV. He started a war on drugs and re repealed the Marijuana Act that had been put in place some 33 years later. They ended up implementing the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, officially prohibiting the use of cannabis for all purposes, including medical. So since its inception in 1970, the DEA has regulated hemp in addition under that act. So hemp is considered a Schedule One drug. So let's talk about where we're at now. It's 2018, nothing's changed. People are sick. You got one in 26 people that are going to be diagnosed with epilepsy. You have 40% of the people that are watching this today that will be diagnosed with cancer, unfortunately. We have 22 veterans a day that are taking their lives, most likely due to post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. And it's safe to say that the entire country has a pain problem, is under an epidemic. We still have a Schedule One imposition on cannabis. It's keeping our researchers from being able to touch it. We still have special interest groups. Big Pharma is the bad guy right now. We also have big alcohol and tobacco that don't like the fact that cannabis is making its way into our country. The pharmaceutical industry is profiting from pain in the opioid epidemic. They don't want to give up their profits. Cannabis poses a major threat to these 
industries. They don't want a world with legalized cannabis. And they're making it really impossible for us. When you look at what cannabis is doing for really people with pain in states where they have legalized cannabis, we see now up to a 77% decrease in opioid overdose deaths. That's the kind of data we have to work with, which is extremely limited in general. But this is the kind of stuff that can, uh, pharmaceutical industry doesn't want to see. What do we know? We know that cannabis is effective. We know that it works. We know it's working for cancer, PTSD, pain. But the data we have to prove it's extremely limited and currently anecdotal. The underlying problem still is that we have a Schedule I restriction on the research of cannabis. Even researchers with DEA approval are having a hard time getting their hands on this. For instance, Dr. Sue Sicily. When you ask Sue what her problem is, it's not that she can't access it or get the approval by the FDA, it's that she can't find veterans to do the research because the VA can't get behind this because of its Schedule One restrictions. Now we look at Johns Hopkins. When you talk to them, they tell us that they can get access to it, although getting to that point, they have to jump through hoops. And when they finally do, it's access to one single strain from the University of Mississippi that's grown outdoors as part of the federal program. It's limited and it's, it's, well, it's one single strain. There's not much you could do with it. One of the major problems is because of this, we don't have any data. Our scientists and researchers can't do what they do best. They can't access the plant and the information within the plant like they could any other medicine. Let's look at an example. California has had the ability for people to medically access this stuff for about 20 years. When you look at an example here from Beth, she's a 73-year-old that was visiting a dispensary for the second time in California to try and find a remedy for her rheumatoid arthritis. She says specifically, the search could be complicated and frustrating. I don't want to get high. I just want to be able to get out of pain. If this doesn't work, I'm through. So if we know cannabis works for pain, why is Beth frustrated? Well, she's frustrated because we have data such as what you see on Leafly that says Blue Dream works for pain, works for sleep, might stimulate you. It's all over the place. It's very limited as to what we have at this current point. Something like Blue Dream may be different in Philadelphia as it is in California because we have strain drift and harvesting times that are different and so on and so forth. It's not what our doctors are looking for. We're still in the dark. They've literally been exposed to just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole heck of a lot of stuff under that surface that we don't know. Safe to say that we're in the dark. We definitely haven't made it very far in 100 years. People are finding relief, yet we haven't scratched the surface as to what's really helping. It's safe to say that William O'Shaughnessy from the 1850s had more freedom to operate and most likely knew more about the effects of cannabis, cannabis and the benefits and therapies that could be used. He knew more than we did then than we do in 19, or 2018. Let's just look at some of the technology that's evolved over the last 100 years. So here we see the invention of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell. Nowadays, you can hold a phone in the pocket of your, of your pants. Everybody in the United States, everyone in the world has one. In fact, we have more cell phones than people. Let's look at the gramophone. When people wanted to listen to music at home, you took a record, a phonograph, and you played it at home. Nowadays, you have every song known to man in the pocket in your phone. Here we see a TV from 1930s. In the, in the right hand, in his right hand, he's holding a cathode ray tube. And the TV is about the same size as the man in it. Now, fast forward to today, and we see Steve Jobs holding an iPad. In his hand, he holds not only an iPad, but every TV, every TV show, I'm sorry, every TV show, every movie, and every song that he needs, that he wants to listen to right there. So just one last draft comparison on, on the right side, you see a child in 2018 holding a phone that includes internet, TV, a thing called email, and something else called video games, all in the palm of his hand. On the other side, you see a child in 1930 holding a knob that's going to give him about three different channels. I think you get the drift. What do we do? We know it's working. We know it's working for cancer, epilepsy, PTSD, autism. 
pain, things of that nature. We know it works more generally for relaxation. It'll wake you up. It'll stimulate your appetite. It'll relax you. We know it's safe. We know that there are no records of anyone dying from taking cannabis. We know it's non-toxic. You know, when we work with these caretakers, we see the toxic soup of narcotics that these children are on. And a lot of times they get lost in the soup. This is a non-toxic version that these parents are happy to see and give their kids. Eventually it helps them wean off and cut down on the suffering. We know we're on to something. In 2003, the United States and the Department of Health became the first uh, assignee to patent cannabinoid, uh, cannabinoid compounds as an antioxidant and neuroprotective. Although this research is a breakthrough, we're still limited. And our researchers can't touch it because this is Schedule 1 imposition. But yet we know it works. When you look at a guy by the name of uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, he was public about opposing marijuana. After he looked under as many rocks as he could, he went back publicly and said that he completely changed his point of view and that he believes that we've been systematically and terribly misled in the United States for over 70 years. I'd have to say I agree with him. It's safe to say that our research and scientists have been handcuffed, really handcuffed for about 100 years. I mean, because of this, it's kept our physicians in the dark and ultimately hurt patients. But one by one, the states are starting to come back. Right now, we have 29 states that have legalized cannabis in one way or another. And it's safe to say that we have collectively reached the tipping point and started to take control back. Technology is advanced to the point that it's going to help us grab data out of that plant and give our researchers the ability to do what they do best. Data that's going to provide us knowledge and insight. Data to provide to our regulators. Data for our researchers. And data for our physicians. Data so that we can start to take action. It's 2018. The technology is here. The science is here. The network's finally in place. We have the ability to communicate all over the world through the use of the internet and share information. Now's the time for science, medicine, and technology to come together and finally break the chains that have been imposed on researchers for the last hundred years. We still know that there's some problems. For instance, we still have special interest groups that are fighting. A lot of the world still has that reefer madness mentality. We still have our anslinger. Because of this, cannabis still remains a Schedule One narcotic. We don't see it being rescheduled anytime soon. Currently, the industry has some growing up to do with products being mislabeled. We have an issue with standardization. It's been the ongoing issue since 1906 in this country. It remains an issue today. Our physicians want to see standardized medicine. They want to be able to repeat treatment and know that they're doing the best for that patient. We need to create methods for standardization of quality so that the, pa this, the, the products that we're given to patients are safe and they're consistent for the physicians that want to be able to consistently dose the same over and over again and provide relief without fear of misleading a patient. You know, they're used to having a pharmaceutical rep come in and tell them that Lipitor is going to work in this many cases and it's also maybe going to hurt this many people. But at least someone did the research. Someone proved that it's going to work. Without access to standardized data and information, our researchers and, and physicians will remain in the dark. So let's face it, for the last hundred years, this plant has been demonized. It's been pretty rough on the species in general, but the tides have finally turned. Science, technology, they're gonna help us drive research and create better medicines for patients. Manufacturing and extraction technology is gonna enable us to fractionate, isolate and reconstitute products into standardized medicine that are going to be pharmaceutical grade, targeted, so we can start to mitigate side effects and really dig down and make effective medicines for our patients. Adequate testing and analysis is finally available so we can certify that our patients are ingesting safe products that meet medical grade standards. And finally, finally, we have technology that can produce qualitative and quantitative information for our researchers so they can effectively measure results, improve medical cannabis efficacy once and for all. So today, we're going to hear from mothers and advocates that took it to their state, to their legislators, and pushed for reform for hopes for a better chance and better therapies for their children. We're going to listen to top medical professionals 
who have firsthand experience utilizing cannabis as a patient therapy. We're going to speak with scientific minds that are working diligently to further studies and gather scientific data. And finally, we're going to speak with researchers that can and will identify disease-targeted therapies. The work from those that will follow will uncover truths that will help change medicine as we see it. Ultimately, better medicines are going to give us a better quality of life. Together, we're going to be able to cut down the fact that 22 veterans a day take their life. We're going to be able to improve on the lives of those affected with epilepsy, autism, cancer, and about 100 other illnesses. And we're going to be able to fight and hopefully effectively wipe out the pain epidemic. It's safe to say that the group you will be hearing from over the next two days will go down as, in history as pioneering cannabis research and will forever improve the quality of life of future generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sosasimo, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Now let's get started. Our first question is, Mr. Sersosimo, the momentum of uh, <clears throat> medical and recreational cannabis reform seems unstoppable in the United States, with two-thirds of Americans having access to legal cannabis. Have we won? Well, I think, I mean, I think it's safe to say the tipping point's been reached. Um, I, I think one of the biggest problems, and, and you, know, you talk about recreation a little bit in there, but let's go back and just talk about medical. I, I, I find it hard to believe that they're going to be able to close Pandora's box at this point. We know that it's working. Um, we see that it's working for children and cancer and pain and all these things, and I just don't see the administration reversing that portion of it. With Jeff Sessions, you know, I, don't, I don't know what his deal is with recreational, but I, I think it's going to be tough. Um, thank you. We have another question that came in. Uh, you talked about the, uh, the limit on uh, researchers being able to access the plant material. Um, how can our researchers and our medical professionals and our scientists expand their body of knowledge about the amazing potential of cannabis sativa and cannabis ruderalis? Well, let's talk about you know, why there's a problem. They can't get their hands on the plant to touch it because of the Schedule One uh, restrictions. So I think you know, where we're headed with it is we're starting to see, and, and you're going to hear over the next couple of days, some of the scientists and researchers and technologists that are in the industry, they're, they're building machinery and technology that's going to enable these researchers to start to really dig down deep into that plant and see what's working and tie it to patient-based therapies and start to look at how that patient, you know, it, things are turning out for patients. Um, yeah, so that hopefully answers that question. Yeah, and I think we have time for one more question, and this goes back to the uh, domestic hemp industry that you touched on earlier. As the domestic hemp industry takes root, so to speak, how does the future of the industry look today? I think I could probably just take one simple example. You could build a house out of hemp fiber in two weeks without the use of any tools. You'd simply use forms. Um, so I just think the, the benefits, the uses, and the, the capabilities of hemp, not only as a, a textile and a building material, but food um, and, and just health in general, um, it's really a, a perfect plant, and it's something that, you know, luckily this, this good earth gave us uh, thousands of years ago. So I, I think what's coming from hemp is going to be exciting. Just like our founding father said, it will be the cash crop that our, um, that our countries uh, build on. You know, if I can add uh, just one little point about uh, the uh, the future of the hemp industry, uh, the DEA considers hemp to be a, uh, a Schedule I uh, controlled substance. It considers anything uh, extracted from hemp, such as cannabidiol, to be Schedule I. Hemp is not permitted, uh, as far as the DEA is concerned, to be, to be grown. Uh, there is recent litigation by the Hemp Industry Association against the DEA, uh, setting forth that the Farm Bill allows for the commercial cultivation and production of hemp based products and that the DEA is overstepping its regulatory authority by attempting to schedule anything uh, cannabis ruderalis as Schedule 1. Uh, there was an amicus 
brief filed by the legislators themselves, mm -hmm. led by Rand Paul, who sponsored the legislation, and they said, DEA, this is what we intended. We did not intend to allow you to uh, schedule this. You are overstepping uh, your regulatory authority. Uh, oral arguments were heard in that case a couple of weeks ago, and I think that uh, the DEA will finally uh, uh, get slapped on the nose, and uh, the result will be uh, uh, the future of this expanding hemp industry. Well, said. Uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, uh, Russ. I'd like to thank you once again for your presentation. And I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for an on-demand viewing for three months from today's date in 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again. Have a great day.